Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show and happy Monday. Here we go, another week. Let's do this. An interesting weekend in politics. Kevin McCarthy finally became Speaker of the House on his 15th try late Friday night. And President Biden finally showed up at the southern border after like 200 years in politics. He finally made it down there for a glorified photo op. So you can rest assured he's on it. He's on the case. Will anything change? Anything? Did he apologize to the Border Patrol agents for smearing them as a bunch of whippers of migrants while he was down there? Mm, No, we'll get into it. Plus, later, we're going to get into Prince Harry continuing to throw his entire family under the bus with one interview after the other. Thank God. I think it's over this week. I think it's finally over so we can stop talking about these losers. Um, But while they're out there telling lies, we will continue covering them because it's absurd and we're not going to let them get away with it. First, however, we are joined by Greg Kelly. No relation, but a dear friend. He's host of Greg Kelly Reports on Newsmax, and he's author of the new book, Justice for All, How the Left is Wrong About Law Enforcement. It's a subject near and dear to his heart and the heart of those he loves most in this world. So I have never been able to compost before. It always seemed too complicated, too much work, something only weird people did, frankly. But no longer, thanks to Lomi. Lomi allows me to turn my food scraps into dirt with a push of a button. It's fun. My little Thatcher's like, when can we compost? Let's do it. He loves putting the stuff in there and pressing the button. Lomi is a countertop electric composter that turns scraps to dirt in under four hours. And it's compact. It's like this big, I'd say, like if you can see, like about this big. And it fits nicely on your on your kitchen counter. It's beautiful. It's white. It, it goes with the aesthetic. Trust me. Anyway, it works in under four hours. There's no smell when it runs. Super quiet. Thanks to Lomi, I have way less garbage each week. And you know when your garbage stinks because all the food scraps are in there? That problem solved too. Instead, I am turning this waste into nutrient-rich dirt that I can then feed to my plants. Now I am composting and creating soil instead of waste, and I feel like a better citizen. I have a basically limitless supply of dirt for my garden, and if you would like to join me in making a positive environmental impact and just having fun with your kids after dinner, making cleanup that much easier as well, Lomi is perfect for you. Go to lomi.com slash mk and use the promo code mk to use to get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 $50 off when you head to lomi.com slash MK. Use that promo code MK for your discount. Uh, food waste is disgusting. Lomi is your solution. With the holidays behind us, but more to come, we got Valentine's Day. We got Easter after that. You might be entertaining for MLK Day, for President's Day. Lomi is going to make your celebration that much easier and more pleasant. Lomi.com slash MK. Greg, great to have you back. How are you? Megan, I'm terrific. Thank you so much. We are so uh, proud of you. Those who, of us who know you from uh, earlier in your broadcasting career, uh, what you've accomplished is amazing. And uh, what an insane moment uh, we're all in the middle of. I never dreamt it could have come to anything remotely like this, but but here we are. Where right is wrong and wrong is right. Yeah, it really, like, the world has turned upside down. And this one of the things I was going to ask you about, but this is a good place to start with it, is when you first launched your show on Newsmax, I remember you saying something to the effect of, look, sometimes I'll be pro-Trump. It was during his presidency. Sometimes I won't. And you sounded like a a right-leaning guy who was sometimes moderate, whatever, but, like, unpredictable. But don't you feel like since that point, the ground underneath your feet has shifted? It's like— I don't know what left and right even is anymore. It has. We are in a parallel universe. I am particularly dismayed. And you're right. I started as the show is one thing and it's evolved into something else. And I think I had to, quite frankly, pull the emergency cord uh, to choose (laughs) a side, to stay with that side, because the other side is lying. They are addicted to lying. They are quite frankly, I believe, and this does sound extreme, and I would not have believed it two years ago, maybe three years ago, they are out to destroy the country. Now, Joe Biden is running for re-election without opposition. There's no significant effort in the Democrat Party to stop him. Now, anybody can see 
that this man does not belong in office and obviously should not be running for office. So what does that mean to all of us? I think it means that the entire system is, in fact, rigged. Um, they have nothing to worry about because big tech is on their side. The mainstream media are on their side. The federal government, the Department of Justice, the FBI are on their side. So for me to play it straight, to say, well, you know, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, everything kind of came together. And I said, I have to pick a side and I'm going to pick the side of truth. Now, I understand there are reasonable people who might disagree with all of that. I think they're reasonable but misinformed. But that's how I became what I am now. No, but I I understand what you're saying. I saw it happen. I saw it happen with you. I saw it happen with the country. I mean, even like Stossel and I were talking recently and he's like, I always thought you were kind of, you know, left-leaning, if anything, in your politics. And I was never really left-leaning except when I was much younger. Um, But I was more left on a couple of social issues, you know, a couple of years ago. And then it's just, I I don't even know what, what is... What does that mean? Even my closest liberal friends don't even understand what it means to be liberal anymore. Does it mean you support the mutilation of five-year-olds uh, who who you've decided want to change their gender because they wore a dress one day? I mean, we're having the craziest stuff happen that no sane person would support, and you're, you're told you're like a far-right person if you object to that kind of stuff. In any event, it really has been a, a wrong is right, a left is right, a, a weird sort of ground shifting, as you point out. And I've I find it as disconcerting as you do. So it is um, interesting to find, to wonder what Democrats would have said from 20 years ago about where we are right now. I mean, no reasonable Democrat from 2004 would be advocating um, that drag queens should be in schools reading to children. I shouldn't be in schools reading to children. I don't have a certificate. (laughs) I'm not a teacher. I, I, I have no desire to be in those classrooms reading to children. And by the way, if you want to be a drag queen, that's fine. I happen to be a fan of RuPaul, um, yeah. one of the best cross dressers slash singers, dancers. He's terrific. But he made those decisions as an adult, 18 and up. The perversion, the sexualization of children. I would think that this is something that we could kind of all embrace and say, this is wrong. And that's why Donald Trump, as bombastic and eccentric as he can seem, is the mainstream candidate. Somebody once Mm. said about these politicians, especially going back to Nixon, look at what they do, not what they say. Actually, Trump has tempered what he's saying, but you look at his agenda. It is a traditional American agenda, one that I am comfortable with, more than comfortable with. I think It's our last chance to save the country. And I do think, and at the moment of truth, I hope that Donald Trump reaches out to the left. I remember in Rocky II, you know, uh, the rematch between Apollo Creed and Apollo, uh, Apollo Creed and Rocky. Rocky Rocky switches from southpaw to right-handed. And it confuses the champ. And I think that Donald Trump has a moment like that in him as well, that there's so much of his message that could actually appeal to the left to those left of center, that Donald Trump wants the world safe for everyone. If you want to be trans, fantastic as an adult, no one can really argue with that. No rational person, I believe, can argue with, well, I take that back because they do all the time. (laughs) (laughs) But But that's interesting. You actually think I've never really heard Donald Trump described that way as the mainstream choice given his positions. And I understand it. Like the, I had Rick Grinnell on the program not long ago, and he was like, "We need it. We need Donald Trump. He's like these people. Th- they can't even say what a woman is. We that's radical. His that was his point. He, that's radical. What Donald Trump says is not radical. He's an eccentric, as you point out, character, and certainly has his flaws, like anybody else. But I don't. I, I've. I, you actually think the left might come around to Trump when they didn't in the midst of the insanity coming upon us on COVID, on George Floyd, on the cr- radical trans ideology. They they didn't come around then. What makes you think they'd come around now? Now, will they come around? Probably not. However, I do think there's a chunk of voters out there that he could make more comfortable voting for him. The so-called swing voters. They're still out there, I'm told, theoretically. Um, 
But I do think the game would change if Donald Trump started talking to them. I am now talking to my enemies. I am those talking to those who hate me. And let me tell you, you have nothing to fear from me. And here's why. Let's face it, the base loves him, although that arguably is possibly in flux. But the base, I believe, is still with him. I think he shouldn't take it for granted, but he has to count on their support and start reaching beyond it. That's my criticism of his of his politics. He never reached out overtly, conspicuously saying, here I am, I am reaching out to the other side. You have to say it out loud. You have to do it in an obvious way. And I think the benefits for him, for the country, for the dialogue would be just astronomical. I had this vision, mm. you know, I was there when Donald Trump declared in June of 2015. I was actually in the room. It was a, <laughs> a fluke, but I was there. And after that speech, and I was no, I was not particularly fond or not fond of Donald Trump. I had this vision, not only that he could win, but he could win a Ronald Reagan type victory, you know, mm. something huge. Um, 40 states, 49 states. It was, the message was that resounding. Now, of course, that was a bit of a, a misread on my part, but I still think in my in my heart that there is that kind of potential. I know it sounds crazy. You know, you talked about with Harry. Him. Uh, sorry. With him. Because I said, I mean, like, there's not a more divisive figure in American politics than Donald Trump. Not to say there can't be. I mean, they'll they'll make a Trump out of whoever gets nominated on the GOP side. You know, you mentioned Prince Harry before, and I've been watching his shenanigans and gossip. And I enjoy your tweets on that. <laughs> <laughs> He's he deserves it, and it's a pleasure. But he <laughs> is gossiping about his own family. And oh, what did I see yesterday? He said, "Well, I'm doing this because people have to talk about mental health, and we have to remove the stigma around mental health." Now, we've been removing the stigma around mental health for about forty years. Okay, okay. that is. There is no stigma anymore. Howard Stern can go on for three hours about his uh, the fantasies he had about his therapist or vice versa. I mean, <laughs> it's okay. We've all been there. I've been to a shrink. It's not a big deal. The stigma is gone. But Harry talks about it. Oprah talks about it. Uh, Officer Harry Dunn. And that brings me to, you know where there is stigma? Talking about your faith. Talking about God. Talking about Christ. Talking about the Bible. Go there, and you're on very thin ice. Talk about children and gender. Oh, yes, this is suddenly a mainstream conversation. So you're right. I mean, the way things look right now, could Donald Trump ever bridge that divide? No. In the natural, he can't. But God can do anything. And I still have this sense, and God works in mysterious ways, so so who knows? But anything can happen, anything. What what do you make of DeSantis? You know, the, the ongoing debate with the, with a hardcore Trump base. Is it his turn? Could you get behind him? Could you get behind him over Donald Trump? Right. That's the thing. If, if Trump doesn't run, that's one thing. But Trump's running and he does not want DeSantis to have it. And then, of course, we're all debating whether DeSantis has a way forward with Donald Trump in the room. Donald, Ron DeSantis will be president someday in 10 years and 15 years. I don't think he should run now. I don't want him to run now. I don't think he's ready to be president. He's a career politician. People overlook that. He's been at this for a very long time. His entire life was designed for one day achieving the ultimate success in politics from his educational background to the steps he made after uh, the steps, quite frankly, even joining the military in the way he did being a Jack lawyer, which is all very honorable, but he's a career politician. By the way, it's that reminds me of Chief Justice John Roberts. Like he, same, like he was born to be Chief Justice of the United States. He has the perfect resume for the job. And yet he's been a, a big disappointment to most Republicans who don't like the way he votes. He is, again, right. He was one of those guys who designed his life in a certain way. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm not enamored with uh, Ron DeSantis. Also, I believe that uh, he's a little bit immature and he has been given too much credit for his showdowns with the media. It reminds me a little bit of Chris Christie circa 2010 and 11. He was great at shutting down, you know, News 12 Trenton. Um, 
and everybody <laughs> delighted. I don't think DeSantis, DeSantis has not really gone up against the heavyweights. He can run circles around News 8 Tampa. And I, let's face it, he's imitating Trump. And that's fine. He is a worthy subject to uh, to emulate. But I believe his messaging, um, his policies, and to a large extent, his style is all based around Trump. One other thing, he's he's got a long way to go as far as mastering the Trump Act. You know, he takes it too far. Trump does not threaten people with violence. You remember Ron DeSantis threatened to throw that little elf into the into Fauci. the Potomac River. I mean, it was. It was too much. It was just, and you know, the commercials that didn't he Trump oh, tell the spectators at one of his events to you know beat the hell out of somebody who cover them. Like you just got to beat the himself. hell out of them. <laughs> too bad we can't do that. You're right. <laughs> I viewed that, and quite frankly, at the time, and that was in 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 15. I was whoa whoa, but it's a long time ago. He's honed his act a little bit. DeSantis is going right for the jugular. It's too much. And one other thing about the governor, and by the way, on policy, and he has a great team, and COVID, I'm impressed. And one day he can be president. But um, watch his debate performance against Andrew Gillum from 2018. Mm. He is not a very good debater. He was almost beaten by a very flawed candidate. So, very flawed. And the mainstream media has no more use for DeSantis than they do Trump. So no. I am not, I'm not jumping on that train. Yeah. I mean, I know that a lot of Republicans are like, but Trump, Trump's in a class of one. They could never, he'd never be as controversial DeSantis as Trump. I don't believe that. Honestly, you and I both lived through, they, they made Mitt Romney into Harvey Weinstein because he had a slip of the tongue in a debate where he said binders full of women instead of binders full of women's resumes. The context made the comment 100% clear. They refused to acknowledge it. They really tried to make him into this raging misogynist. If they can do that to Mitt Romney, they can do whatever they want to Ron DeSantis and Republicans are kidding themselves, kidding themselves if they think they're not going to. Well, you know, and they'll do it to whomever. They'll do it to Glenn Youngkin and his little fleece sweater vest. Can you believe it? I mean, he's been governor for one year and that stunt they pulled with the white supremacists, the so-called white supremacists. And oh, by the way, I believe that was the Lincoln Project. A lot of Republicans and former Ugh, Republicans facilitating this kind of stunt. You know, everybody's upset about uh, the chaos and the, the 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 factionalism within the Republican Party that we saw last week. Number one, I don't agree. I actually enjoyed the discussion. I thought it was fine. They started Tuesday. They figured it out by Friday. That's mm -hmm. totally fine. But look at the pressure that the Republican Party has been under for the past seven years. I mean, and beyond, but uh, from Democrats, of course, from the mainstream media and within the party, within the party. What Steve Schmidt and some of these others, and I know he's officially no longer a Republican, but what they have done to other Republicans, the scorched earth, they have bragged about sabotaging the White House, sabotaging the White House. And I never would have said it four years ago, but the deep state and what they've been up to. So it's OK. And actually, I don't like the cliche that democracy is messy. I heard it a million times. I thought it was silly last week, but it's kind of supposed to be messy. It's kind of supposed to be a little bit divided. And I like I like what happened last week. 212 Democrats voting in the same direction. That is uh, that's a party discipline that other countries are good at. We're not supposed to be good like that. Mm. You know, I, I talked about this quite a bit last week. I'm sure you, you did as well and kind of had a similar take. Like I, I fail to feel like I need the vapors because they're holding up the vote and they, they're they trying to bargain with the power that they had, you know, those 20 plus conservatives, because they had it because of the electorate. The reason they were in a position to get McCarthy to bend on certain things is because of the electorate. The electorate empowered them by not showering new, more moderate Republicans all over the House of Representatives. We have divided government between GOP and Dem, but we also have divided government within the GOP and to some extent within the Democratic Party, though they're more disciplined in their voting. And um, it wound up what? So that these, these holdouts are going to get a bigger say on budget bills before we just pass them, you know, and actually reading what's in it. Like, I, 
I, I think people like the New York Times absolutely loved what happened last week in the Republican Party because it sort of fostered a narrative that it's a party in disarray and a party that won't be able to govern. We'll see, right? We'll see. I, uh, you know, I, I learned today, and I, I actually need to do a little bit more research, but apparently the ousting of a speaker, that it can be initiated by just one member, is the system they had before Nancy Pelosi was there. Uh, yeah. I heard some Republicans, Dan Bishop and others, saying that most of this is just undoing what Pelosi did. Certainly it hasn't been portrayed like that. I think they're doing a little bit of spinning. But yeah, just like you said, they are fostering this um, this discord because that's what the mainstream media does do. And by the way, that is a problem. If you are existing in America, doing your job, barely paying attention to the media, not proactively seeking out alternative content, you're probably going to believe this stuff. Oh, yeah, January 6th. Yeah, oh, that was terrible. Uh, oh, the Republicans, they really can't get it together. Unless you are taking proactive steps, and most people aren't, and I don't blame them for not doing that, for going about their business, living their lives. You have to think about it. And there are a lot of other things to worry about. Well, I mean, every every report that comes out of January 6th, every news article on January 6th and the committee should remind people that this is a one-sided proceeding, that the prosecution only got to present its case. There was no defense, right? There was no defense. So I don't, I really try to avoid conclusions of that committee because I don't trust the committee. Why would I allow them to poison my mind on what happened or what didn't happen in the Trump camp or elsewhere when I know the whole thing, talk about rigged, 100% rigged. And I know how it got that way. And there was an argument between, you know, McCarthy and Pelosi about whether there'd be a Republican, what kind of Republican. She didn't want Jim Jordan. How did, why does she get to say, right? It's like, why would you pull their best puncher, right? Like the, Jim Jordan's their best puncher after Trey Gowdy left for Fox News. Uh, in any event, there was no defense of President Trump. So I, I feel as you do about that committee and everything that comes out of it. But now they want us to draw conclusions on it. Now Liz Cheney thinks she's got a shot at president because of it. Now Cassidy Hutchinson is a household name because of it. Um, I don't know. It's wrapped up. It's gone. There's a new Congress in town and they're no longer around. So where do we stand on it now? What do you, what do you think of it now that it's all said and done? Well, I thought it was going to go away as an issue, but the Sunday shows yesterday, it's still there. They they think it works for them, and it does. I was out west in Colorado, and I saw some relatives, and uh, they generally lean to the right, but they were telling me, well, the January 6th thing has really soured them on Trump. So again, if you're going about your business and you see this stuff, the staging, uh, the primetime hearings, you're going to have this kind of funny feeling like, well, they wouldn't go to through all this trouble if... Trump weren't responsible, but he wasn't. And it's fascinating to me to actually sit down and read the um, the January 6th report. This You're the one. Is, sorry? You're the one <laughs> who did it. <laughs> it's incredible that, number one, who has the time, who has the bandwidth, who has the desire? Someone's going to give us the gist of it. So as an experiment, I read the whole thing over the um, Christmas break. And by the way, you'll Poor be surprised. Judith. Judith must have been like, for the love of God, Greg, what do you do? Put that down and have a cocktail, have a cocoa. Let's go do something other than Jan 6th reading. She was uh, a little bit uh, miffed. But uh, however, <laughs> it was, look, when we weren't skiing, I was reading. And the fact that that was produced on government paper, government time, that is waste, fraud, and abuse right there. It is, there are some moments, there's some truth in there, but their conclusions, for instance, and I, I don't think anybody has brought this up. You heard that Donald Trump was watching television as the Capitol was ransacked and he didn't call the National Guard. He didn't call the Pentagon. He didn't call anybody. What comes through when you actually read it is nobody called him. No one called him. I'm not talking about the Brian Kilmeads and the Laura Ingrams. I'm talking about anybody calling him, Vice President Pence, the Secretary of Defense, the Attorney General. No one called him. Also, he was watching television. How could he just sit there and watch television? And this was, everybody kind of understood this. This is the most horrible image of President watching television and, and, and feasting on all of this. Well, did anybody actually go back and watch what was on television on January 6th? 
if you actually watch what was being played, the images are not what we've come to associate with January 6th in the following uh, today, what we associate with the horns guy, uh, the video from the inside, that all came out in succeeding days. There were a couple of images on the inside. The key moment is 2.38 p.m. And it's Fox News. And uh, an anchor, I think it's Brett Baer, says, well, this looks very serious. But if you look at what's actually on the screen, you see people walking in a park, literally people walking in a park. There was such a gap between what the media were saying and what was actually occurring That's interesting. in those images. I've never gone back. And rewatched. I remember watching the television on Jan six, and I don't. And I don't remember what was actually being played when they were saying, "Where's the president? Where's the president?" But I mean, to me, uh, January six was not was not a good day for this country. It was an embarrassment. But whether Trump was responsible for the violence that day and so on, I, they didn't prove that he was responsible for pushing election denialism claims that were in the minds of a lot of people who were there on January sixth. Most of whom did not participate in any violence whatsoever, most of whom believed the claims and were upset and went and just supported their president. Um, but I don't think, just because I wouldn't put the violence on Jan 6th on him doesn't mean I wouldn't put the election denialism on him. And that's a whole other ball of wax that the relatives in Colorado may be holding against him fairly, I think. You can say he had legitimate objections, but you can't say he's not responsible for election denialism. Well, election denialism is, uh, if I may, is slightly pejorative and uh and that's okay a lot of folks feel that way but for me i mean i can prove that the votes cast in pennsylvania were cast unconstitutionally you know yeah. famously, well, there's a whole legal issue there but it was resolved it was resolved by the courts against trump it was not resolved prior to um it was not resolved prior to election day in my opinion now you know and i would love your opinion on this megan as a lawyer you know if I want to sue somebody, I have a gut instinct. Perhaps I have hardcore evidence, but I have a sense that I've been wronged by somebody. Generally speaking, I don't have smoking gun proof. Any plaintiff right off the bat may or may not have. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. Often they don't. They have a sense that they've been wronged. And then they go to court and they figure out whether or not you are truly a victim, whether or not you truly this transaction happened, whether or not you have standing. And then the case goes forward. You don't have to have conclusive proof at the outset that mm -hmm. you're right. There is a process called discovery. And I don't think that many of us, you know, the January 6th report goes through, I think, six cases where judges said out loud that you are wrong here. You have no evidence, you know, shame on you. Dozens and dozens of cases were very, very technical, and it was about standing, whether or not you have the right to be standing here, whether or not you are the aggrieved party. Is it you, the mm -hmm. Trump campaign? Is it you, the people of Pennsylvania? It gets well, convoluted. Let me, let, me, let me just let me jump in. I get it. I get it. I get all that. First of all, you have to have a good faith belief in order to raise allegations in a court complaint. That's all that's required in the beginning, a good faith belief. Um and then you proceed to discovery, correct. And in these election challenges, it's very fraught because by necessity, we need to resolve those relatively quickly. You can't go four years, which would easily be the length of a litigation, to resolve a presidential election, right? Like they have a greater speed requirement in the election claims than they do in a slip and fall. So I get that. And it's being challenged now as a result of Trump and so on in a way we've never seen before. And we talked about this recently where they're really gonna need to shore those up now. We, we really do need to take a look at election challenges because one good thing about the Trump challenges is he lifted up the, the hood and it was a mess under there, right? So like, not, not everywhere, but in some places it was a mess. Look what happened to Cary Lake out in Arizona. It was a mess in Maricopa County. And there needs to be a better system for hearing challenges on an expedited basis that allow evidence from the from the challenging party. However, I do remember covering this live when Rudy Giuliani said in court, this is not a fraud case, judge. We don't have evidence of fraud. It's not a fraud case, which is what we hear over and over and over that, it, that they committed fraud and they whatever. So Giuliani was, you know, and I have a lot of respect and I know he, obviously your dad and so on, but he was a mess during those proceedings. He was not a strong litigator. And I think he lost and gave up the farm on a lot of those. And th that wasn't 
anybody's fault but his and, and the lack of, you know, proof, his lack of effort and sort of getting what he needed in order to make the arguments to the judge in good faith. So let me offer this about Rudy. He did look a little bit like a madman going back a couple of years. Wait, wait, and just, and just Greg, believe- just tell him, just tell him, because I referenced your dad, but some people don't know what I'm talking about. So just give the, sure. the lineage there, no, your, 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 your dad and Rudy and so on. Well, you know, quite frankly, my father and Rudy Giuliani were rivals for a good chunk of their careers. Um, Rudy Giuliani, of course, the former mayor, my father, a two-time, a two-term uh, police commissioner here in the city. I would say they are, they're friendly now, but it wasn't always that way. My father, police commissioner for 14 years, Rudy Giuliani, uh, actually almost appointed my father police commissioner back in 1993. So, um, and I, quite frankly, at for a time, was a little bit wary of Rudy, but there's no denying the, the enormous contributions um, uh, this in this city. He saved hundreds, he saved tens of thousands of lives, primarily young men of color, and the leadership he provided on September 11, 2001. Now, more mm-hmm. recently, you see him running around <laughs> looking a little bit frazzled. Why is that? Now, my belief is because he has the weight of the world on his shoulders. In 2018, 2019, 2020, you know, he's going to Ukraine. Are journalists going to Ukraine? Is Maggie Haberman going to Ukraine? Is the Daily Beast going to Ukraine? No, they can't. They don't want to. They don't even have the resources if they wanted to. Giuliani is doing all of this himself. The mainstream media infrastructure should have been doing all of it for him. So he's doing that. He's also regarding the election. I mean, that's a good story. Potential, potential voting irregularity. Yet immediately they dismissed it, the mainstream. And Rudy was again on his own. And that moment in the court, which is an important one, and I think it speaks to kind of the, in my opinion, the misunderstanding of 2020, he was arguing the constitutional issues in Pennsylvania, the con- the state constitution issues. And we believe that they violated the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's constitution in the way they set up mail-in voting. And that's what he meant when he said, this is not a fraud case. I'm saying the constitution in this state says you can vote two ways, in person or absentee with excuse. That's it. If you want to change the constitution, you can. But you well, that's do- an interesting point. I got to go back and check whether it was in the Pennsylvania case that he said that. Uh, and I, I think it may have been said in more than one case. But the point in Pennsylvania was the lack of standing. He, he should have brought that case earlier. You can't wait until you lose and then go into court and say it was unfair. That's a, that's a legitimate ruling by a court. You're too late. You're out of time. And you're not the one who should have brought If you, It shouldn't have been you. And if, if it were you, you should have brought it a long time ago, not once you lost. Do you remember 2000, the recount? The Republicans brought in James Baker, former Secretary of State, David Boys, about two dozen other top litigators. Now, because Trump is Trump and because the mainstream and the culture, much of it has so toxified him that nobody <laughs> nobody can get near him and not incur a great deal of risk. They scared off litigators. I mean, for me, the that's true. The issue is He's so still much having big, that problem. Still having that problem. So the issue is so much bigger than well, Rudy Giuliani lost that round. There should have been a platoon, um, a, a battalion of top flight litigators, and there weren't. Mm-hmm. And it's it was too big. I see. The, I see your point. And you know, Alan Dershowitz has talked about this on his podcast, and it really is concerning that once they what they did to him after he defended, as he says, the Constitution, not Trump, in Trump's impeachment trial, like the the first one, you know, the real one, not the one that was knee-jerk after Jan 6. um, He was completely smeared. He was, you know, he was ostracized. People mock him saying, all my Martha's Vineyard's friends, like, they don't have dinner with me anymore. But think about it. The man, I think Alan, he might be 85, 86 years old right now. I'm sure it would be hurtful. Um, And so there are a lot of white shoe lawyers saying, I'm not I'm not going to have that happen to me. Worked my whole life. Look, Alan, Harvard Law School, respected professor, you know, all these cases he handled that were, they made movies out of his lawyering and so on. And then suddenly, as an octogenarian, you can't speak his name. You can have dinner with him. He can't read his book at the library. They don't even carry his. 
So this is actually a thing that did happen in the legal community. And it's one of the reasons why Trump cannot get a good lawyer right now. So you're, you're, you are onto something there. All right, wait, I'm onto something too. It's a commercial break. We're gonna take two minutes off. We're gonna come right back with my pal, Greg Kelly. This could go on forever. I'm really enjoying this conversation. I uh, hope you are too. Greg Kelly stays with us. Don't leave. Whether you wanna get more fit or be a better parent or just get more done at work, there is one thing that's gonna help you and that is better sleep. With Miracle Made sheets, you can tap into the power of self-cooling temperature regulation, which has been shown to improve sleep quality by up to 34%. Miracle Made sheets have self-cooling properties for better quality sleep. They use silver-infused fabrics. This is cool. Originally developed by NASA. They are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands. Stop sleeping on bacteria. Clean sheets mean less bacteria to clog your pores and fewer breakouts and other skin problems. Go to trymiracle.com slash MK to try it today. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Save over 40% and be sure to use our promo code MK at checkout to save even more than the 40% and get three free towels. And Miracle is so confident in their product, they back it with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you are not 100% satisfied, you will get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash MK. Use the code MK to claim your free three-piece towel set on checkout and save over 40%. Trymiracle.com slash MK to treat yourself. Thanks, Miracle Made, for helping to sponsor this episode. So before we get to the book, let me let me let's talk about Biden at the border. He decided to go for three hours, Greg. Three hours. So now he understands it, I'm sure. And um, missing on his little trip down there was any apology to the border patrol for smearing them. While he and his DHS secretary, who went out and smeared them too, uh, knew that they had whipped no one. And the evidence has come out that Mayorkas was told before he went out and briefed the press about how they'd been whipping the migrants. He was told the Reuters photographer who took those photos saw nothing of the kind and is saying that's an, that's erroneous. And Mayorkas did it anyway. And then Biden did it too. Uh, and now he wants us to believe he's an honest broker when it comes to our problems down there as we set actual records for the number of border arrests. 2.4 million in fiscal year 2022. It was bad enough last year, fiscal year 2021, where it was 1.7 million. It's truly out of control right now. What do you make of it all? The orchestration is right out of North Korea. It's it's out of the Soviet Union that somebody could come. He even looked a little bit Soviet-esque. He even reminds me of Leonid Brezhnev, you know, that same kind of demeanor. I am appalled, uh, obviously, and stunned and confused. But here's what makes sense. They want the border to be open. I wouldn't have accepted that a couple of years ago. I have been somewhat, I don't want to say radicalized, but my eyes have been opened. The Democrats want the votes and the globalists want the cheap labor. There's no other justification or explanation as to how this has been allowed to fester in this manner. It is bad for everybody. It is bad for America. And it it is so contrary to... Um, even the Democrat Party ideals. I have this in my book. We talk about the, the the Border Patrol horseback heroes, I call them. Barbara Jordan, a Democrat, lesbian, African-American from Texas, 25 years ago, wrote a the, the, the Jordan Commission, which she chaired, a report that advocated the building of a wall and strict immigration policies. Um, Cesar Chavez, the famous uh, agriculture uh, protester slash organizer, viewed illegal immigrants as a threat to his cause because they could work for. So Joe Biden, this scares me in a way, almost. There's no Democrat getting ready to run for president right now. None. And this is the time where you run. Obama declared in February of 07. We're right there in the cycle. Hillary declared in January of 07. You do it now. And what I'm hearing is they're doing everything they can, the Biden administration, and they don't have to work that hard to discourage a uh, an opponent in the primary. Because a one-term president almost 
always has a primary opponent. We've only had two one-term presidents in our lifetimes, I think, um, Megan. We had Jimmy Carter and George H.W. Bush. And oh, yeah. each of these guys uh, had a significant primary challenge. They think if they can quash that possibility, they're in. And the way things are set up right now, they are. Things are so bad down there. I mean, that's how bad it's gotten. That President Biden had no choice but to actually at least make it look like he's on the problem. I mean, that's what this is what it took. The, this record num number of arrests at the border. And, and that number, 2.4 million, does not include the number of getaways, gotaways, as they refer to them, people who evaded law enforcement. So you can only imagine how bad it is. It's really disturbing. And there's no plan. There's absolutely no plan. Um, I wanted to ask you, Greg, before we get to the law enforcement in the book, because I love this. I, I love, like, you took a deep dive in how we got here. Um, quickly, because you also served... You're you remember the armed forces, right? It was was it? Were you a marine? Refresh my memory. Marine, what branch of the military? I was a uh, Marine Corps captain, and then I went on to be a lieutenant colonel in the reserves. I flew Harrier jets in the Marine Corps, uh, nine years active duty, and um, I loved it. It was an adventure. It took me all over the world, met fascinating people, and um, it made me better to do this or other things um, because I grew up not in journalism. Mm -hmm. I grew up doing something else. And quite frankly, that's what comes through about you, Megan. I, I am drawn to people who have an expertise in something apart from talking, <laughs> apart from yeah. getting on television. And that's I think it. that's one of the keys, one of the many keys to your success. And uh, to a lesser extent, mine, because, you know, this is kind of a corrupt culture, the media, the mainstream media. Yes. And I feel I, I never felt comfortable with them. I had never felt at home. I spoke the same language. And I shouldn't say that. There was a time where I did feel comfortable. I'll tell you about the time I realized I had no business being there, though. The moment. It was at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Ugh. And George H.W. Bush was the speaker. It was in 2004, I believe. And he started making jokes about where the weapons of mass destruction are. And he had pictures of himself looking in the White House for the weapons of mass destruction. Well, they're not under here. Maybe they're over here. This is in 2004 when the occupation was going down. Uh, it looked like a disaster. And that room erupted in laughter. And I had spent a lot of time there. Not H.W., George W. Bush. George W. Bush. Yeah, okay. 2000, did I say H.W.? And it was- uh, I don't know. Just to be clear, was, that was the younger. I got it. Yeah, 2004. He was president. It was a it was a moment for me where I realized um, just how maybe corrupt is too strong a word, but how careless or or uninvolved they actually are in the results of these policies. To them, this is a game; it doesn't affect them. And I, I just said, I actually thought about running for Congress for a brief period of time after that. I was so fired up. And it's one of the things, quite frankly, that drew me to Trump, his avowed opposition to the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. Well, you, I mean, unlike most of us have actually fought for our country, you've been, um, as you point out, nine years as a Marine. And then when I first came to know you, when we were just cub reporters at Fox, we shared an office together for a short time. That was fun. Kelly and Kelly Incorporated. And, um, that was right around, I joined Fox in 2004, and this was right around the time at, after which you'd been an embed, right? You'd been an embed as a reporter and were there when we, was it Iraq or Afghanistan? Forgive me, it must've been Afghanistan. It had to be Afghanistan because that's where we went first. It was um, it was Iraq actually, because it was, it was still, okay. you know, we, we, we thought it was over. The invasion happened in 2003 and I kept going back and I knew ahead of time that it was a bad move. I had flown over Iraq. I had never seen tremendous combat. I had never seen combat as a Marine. Technically, it was. I flew over Iraq. It was a rather benign mission enforcing the no-fly zone in the 90s. The worst combat I ever saw was as a journalist. But I knew ahead of time that it was the bad move. I knew that the Saddam country. Hussein posed no threat to anyone. Yeah, but I remember those pictures of you all bloodied up from one of those. It was it was actually amazing. It was like, oh my God, respect. 
it just made me feel like a very small person sitting next to you. Like, well, I, I argued some cases. I, I tried a couple. It's like, look at what this guy has done. So anyway, my point is simply that you've earned the right to your good opinion, and uh, I'm I'm delighted to be hearing it. And then, and then I did want to ask you because I I've been asking my team, what are the military guys that we know and trust saying about this Prince Harry thing? Because I just think it's kind of interesting to see a soldier who fought in these wars come out and say, "This is the number of guys that got killed. I killed 25 Taliban, and they were like chess pieces on the board." I'm not surprised to learn it. It didn't. It wasn't emotional for him. He didn't see them as like human beings. I I can understand how. That's how you'd have to look at the enemy in order to, you know, kill them from a helicopter. But to to put a number on it, I'm not used to hearing uh, combat soldiers put a number on it. What was your reaction to that? I was um, very surprised and turned off. Um, like you, the only other time I ever heard anybody say, I have 15 kills or 25 confirmed kills, I believe was in Rambo, <laughs> uh, in the movie Rambo. He was talking about 25 certified kills. And I, you know, my father was in Vietnam for a year. And it's actually something we've never talked about and something I would never ask him. And I know, quite mm -hmm. frankly, I know where he was. I know what he was doing. I know I know a lot about his experience in Vietnam based on the public record. And I talked to him a bit, but I've never asked him if he's killed anyone. Um, and I wouldn't. And the idea to put that in a in a in a memoir, it's it's just a turn off. Uh it's not done. It's kind of seen as unprofessional mm -hmm. in a strange way. So mm -hmm. look, it's his book. He can write what he wants. Um, I do think though, it arguably endangers British troops, um, right. a figure like that and his cavalier approach. I'll tell you the one person who did ask my father about, uh, um, did he ever kill anybody? And he did it not without charm, was Howard Stern when he was, my of dad course. wrote his uh, memoir and he actually asked him, did you kill anybody? And he's the only guy who could do it and actually pull it off. And my dad kind of laughed it off. He didn't really answer. Howard can get away with things the rest of us get. Yeah, Howard found out my bra size when I went on the Howard <laughs> Stern show. He found out how many times I'm having sex a week with my husband. Well, he tried, he tried, he assumed. He goes, I, I got you for a two time a week girl. I'm like, oh my God, what's happening? Okay, um, listen, let's talk about the book for a minute because I love that you go through what's happened to the police, these these people who have defunded the police, and then, of course, now many of them refunding the police quietly without owning the damage they've done, um, and sort of the history of what's happened, like the, the history of crime, you know, what's happening in the prisons and why we shouldn't necessarily be so apologetic about it, and the prisons are good things. In any event, how would you describe your book to the audience listening now? Like, what, what do you think, why did you think it was necessary? You know, I hope it's a beacon of sanity and I'm saying things that need to be said that we understand are true in this totally corrupt, bizarre moment. Um, I track the corrupt origins of Black Lives Matter. A lot of folks don't realize that Black Lives Matter was actually created um, in an effort to bail out Barack Obama politically. Barack Obama was suffering in 2012 with black supporters. He uh, his support was dropping almost to the double digits. They thought he was going to do great things. He did not. And Obama had to make a choice. Remember, he came in in 08 saying, you know, I'll be the post-racial president. I can. And in fact, he did talk to a group of black men and say, we have too many of you who are AWOL. Too many of you are MIA. It's time to step up. Well, they threatened to castrate him for saying that. And he never went there again, maybe once in his presidency in the most tepid way. And Obama chose that I'm going to be not a post-racial Obama. I'm going to be black Obama. And he writes about this himself. He's always been viewed with suspicion in the black community. Uh, is he black enough? Is he white enough? So there's so much that needs to be said. We can pretend that the problem in America is not enough people of color and television commercials and on movies and not enough diversity, equity, and inclusion offices, although I don't think anybody would say that anymore. But the real driver of crime is the lack of fathers, particularly in communities of color. And it's um, it's awkward to possibly say, especially for a Caucasian person, but I am done with that. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I, I don't suffer from those hangups anymore. And if he's not going to talk about it, 
And if the mainstream and corporate America are going to pretend that there's not a problem, to hell with them, I'm going to confront it. And I hope I well, do in this book. Especially when in the book you point out that the that vast majority of the victims are are black victims. I mean, this this is we have to get honest about what's causing the problems of crime in the country and the murder rate um, and what we need to do to stop it. This is why you point out in the book, the vast majority of black voters are against the defund movement. They want more cops, not fewer, something you will not hear in the mainstream media, but you will hear in Greg Kelly's new book. Please buy it. Support Greg and his important voice. It's called Justice for All, How the Left is Wrong About Law Enforcement. Great to see you, Greg. Come back anytime. Thank you, Megan, so much. All the best. And to you. All right, we'll be right back. Don't go away. Is your business still using spreadsheets and emails to manage important sales commission? Mm Mm-mm. Is your support and operation staff stretched thin? Not good. Are your salespeople constantly trying to piece together the puzzle for what they're getting paid for and what is potentially missing from their comp? Well, this is where Clear Comp comes in. Clear Comp is a one stop shop for your business to manage sales commission documentation like commission plan info, product info, and facts. It's basically a sales operations and sales enablement dream platform. Clear Comp works seamlessly and securely with your existing software applications for your billing, CRM, HR, you get the picture. Your sales team will perform their best with real-time results and earnings using ClearComp's interactive dashboards. And your operations team will be able to make commission plan adjustments with just a few clicks, super easy. So please, get this done already, right? It's time. Modernize your sales organization. Improve your business today by visiting ClearComp, C-O-M-P, Dot com. That's C-L-E-A-R-C-O-M-P dot com. Book a demo and tell them I sent you. We are covering the Prince Harry interviews. He gave one to Anderson Cooper of 60 Minutes. He gave one to ITV over in Great Britain. Uh, Tom Bradbury, I think his name is. Uh, the guy, same guy who asked Megan how she was when she was in the middle of Africa and she was so grateful. No one's asked. Thank you, because no one's asked. Right, because we're focused on the people who are actually in need, not you. In any event, uh, then he sat down with Michael Strahan of ABC. He's promoting his book, and soon we're going to get Stephen Colbert. That will be insufferable. Um, he's promoting his book, Spare, right, which is out this week, Comes hits stands officially tomorrow, but of course the press has poured over it, and we have gotten so many highlights or lowlights, depending on your point of view. This is where I want to start before we bring in our panel. He said to Anderson, as far as his own personal accountability, right? Because this is the thing. He's out there blaming his brother. He blames his father. He blames his mother-in-law. He's even taken a shot at his dead mother, Diana, in, in the book. It, I could go on. But you know who he doesn't blame at all? Himself, his wife. They've done nothing. Absolutely nothing. And so thankfully, this issue did come up. Like, what about you guys? I think this was with Anderson. Could it, was it with Anderson in any event? What about you guys? Did you do anything wrong? How about you? And here is how he responded. In the book, you called this a, a full-scale rupture. Can it be healed? Yes. The board is very much in their court. But, you know, Megan and I have continued to say that we will openly apologize for anything that we did wrong. But every time we ask that question, no one's telling us the specifics or anything. There needs to be a constructive conversation, one that can happen in private that doesn't get leaked. I assume they would say, well, how can we trust you? How do we know that you're not going to reveal whatever conversations we have in an interview somewhere? This all started with them briefing daily against my wife with lies to the point of where my wife and I had to run away from our from my country. Okay, so he needs somebody to give him specifics on what they did wrong. He needs specifics. And only then will he apologize. I got you, Prince Harry. I got your back. Or right, here's just a couple off the top of my head, all right? Your wife's a bully. Her former press communications person who worked for both you and your brother, Jason Knopf, is on the record about the bullying she committed against people who were younger than she was, or who are less powerful than she was within the palace, who she made cry all the time. One of the other people that she apparently made cry was Princess Kate. She told Oprah that Kate made her cry, but now we know from your own book, Harry, that it was Meghan calling Kate 
a baby brain. It's your baby brain after she gave birth to her third child to explain Kate's complaints about Megan's wedding plans. All right? That's not polite. That is rude, as Prince William later told you in referring to your wife. That has a tendency to make people not like you when you have the nerve to comment on their hormones after they just had a baby when you barely know them. Number two, she's a brat. We know from Dan Wooten's reporting, which is, you can take it to the bank, Dan's what Dan's reporting, he's got very solid sources, he broke Megxit and he was right, that she was upset about her tiara. She wanted the one and she couldn't get it because it had some stone that was controversial, et cetera. And Harry said what Megan wants, Megan gets, and the queen had to reprimand him. That's the kind of story that makes people dislike you within the royal family and without. Your wife abandoned her entire family. That's another thing, in favor of celebrities at her wedding. She cut ties with virtually everybody whose shoulders she had stood on on her way up the fame scale uh, just as soon as she met you. Well, that seems a little rude too, kind of disloyal, also annoying. And then what was George Clooney doing at your wedding? You didn't know him. She didn't know him. That's who she had there instead of the sweet cousin who or her stepsister, whatever it was, who she had supposedly grown so close to. She, you said that in your Netflix documentary. She forgot that girl. She ghosted her because apparently she didn't make the grade. N- never mind her step-siblings and so on, half-siblings. Uh, your fights with the press. You two look like a couple of whiny babies, and it's been going on for years. How many lawsuits have you filed against the mail and so on? Forget the lawsuits, though. It's your whiny statements about the nasty press. Every single celebrity deals with it. You don't think George Clooney's had negative things written about him? Tom Cruise had negative things written about him? He doesn't use his speeches or his media appearances to whine about the mean media and they say the things that aren't true. We're sick of it. Shut up about your negative press coverage. Do you, does somebody like Beyonce, who you love so much, look for a negative, obscure comment online as representative of her experience with the press? and then act like a victim because of it? No, no, she doesn't. Because she understands she's had a similar experience to the one that you and your wife had for the vast majority of your time in the public eye. Absolutely fawning media coverage. You're the ones who made it turn. You, not Prince William, not King Charles, not Camilla. You, they've given you fawning coverage. It is the opposite of what you are claiming. And it makes people dislike you, these constant complaints. Okay, here's another one. You're a leaker too. You're upset that the royal family leaks on you. You leak just as much as they do. You use Omid Scobie, your little stenographer at Harper's Bazaar. You use People Magazine. But we all see what you're doing while you claim you have clean hands and you absolutely do not. Here's another one. You abandon the royal family in their greatest time of need. Both of you. You planned, mixed it, and executed on it. For one thing, when Prince Philip was dying in the hospital, you sat down with Oprah and called the royal family a bunch of racists. By the way, they now deny that. We'll get to it. Um, You didn't care. And you didn't even have the decency to rule him out or the queen when you knew he was in the hospital. And very elderly man, your own grandfather. Nope, still wanted your moment in the sun with the queen of Montecito. Well, uh, when the actual queen, Queen Elizabeth, your grandma was in the hospital, you were two were sunning yourselves out in California. Everybody on the royal family went out there and upped their royal duties so that she could be rest assured the family still had her back and was representing the royal family, not you two. You were in the midst of your wine-a-thon out there on the West Coast. You were happy to call her family racist when she was in her last year on earth. You made the queen's stress level go up, not down, when she was at her most aged and infirm. You two both constantly play the victim. That's our number one complaint about you, despite the enormous privileges life has handed you. This is why we can't stand you. And it probably irritated your brother and your father and your mother-in-law too, right? You go out on Oprah, you and your wife and want us to care about what title your kid is going to get or how big your castle is, like you complain about in Netflix, what color designer dresses you were forced to wear in your wife's case without stopping for two seconds to acknowledge the struggles of real people. No one cares about your kid's damn titles or your tiny castle or your beige dress. No one feels sorry for you, but you continue asking us to do so. And we're sick of it. All right. Your wife even wanted us to accept her as a, as a me too victim saying she'd been objectified. She was objectified because people looked at her on the set of deal or no deal and didn't want her opinion on inflation. (laughs) 
<laughs> she was objectified. No good deed goes unpunished. They give her the role of a lifetime. It was. She was a total unknown. Put her on national television. Gave her beautiful dresses to wear. Did her hair and makeup. And all she can remember is, they told me to suck in my stomach and didn't pronounce my name correctly. I was objectified. What the hell do you think a model does? That's what you were on that show. You were a model. People pay to look at you. That's objectification. Deal with it. Or don't. But don't take the money. Climb the ladder of success and then show absolutely no gratitude and complain that you were objectified. That's why you got a paycheck. You and she both lie. A lot. Especially your wife. Oh, I was told by the guy in The Lion King that people that hadn't celebrated like this when I married Harry like they did since Mandela was freed. Lie. Lie. As The Lion King cast has come out and said. You claimed your baby was in grave danger when there was a fire in the nursery when you did the overseas trip. He was nowhere near the fire. It was smoke out of a errant heater, and he was nowhere near it. He was not in danger. But you did that to make yourself look more aggrieved than, in fact, you were. That's a pattern with you. You suggested the royals are racist, as I mentioned, without a scintilla of truth. Now you reverse that, and you blame the press for that, too. All right? By the way, these two, as they now claim that they never call the royals Racists, that's what Harry's claiming, that neither he nor his wife ever called the royals racists, despite what we heard in the Oprah interview. They accepted an award, like two weeks ago, in New York City, for standing up to, and I quote, the structural racism within the royal family. That was Carrie Kennedy, whose family was presenting them with the award. Did they stand up and say, this is an outrage. Our family's not racist. We never said such a thing. No. They took the award and loved every second of it. So spare me now that the blowback has been bad, that you didn't call them racist because you did. We saw it, it's on tape. You constantly lecture the so-called little people on how they need to be better people, more like you, we guess, while showing zero appreciation for their problems, right? Harry had the nerve to lecture us on white supremacy and white privilege. Then their Netflix documentary calls all Brexiters racist, if you wanted, if you were in, in favor of Brexit, which the majority of Great Britain residents were, you're racist. She's out there telling us, don't, don't call women difficult. By the way, we now know that's what Prince William called her. So like I said before, that whole Spotify series she did was her working out her own issues. She doesn't want you to be able to say women are difficult because that's what Prince William said about her. Don't say diva, don't say bitch. I'm sure they called her that too. You're hypocrites. You lecture us on the environment and how we need to go green and do better as citizens while you're on your private jets and your SUVs with your enor enormous mansion out in Montecito saying reportedly it's not big enough or good enough for you, right? And these are the reasons why we can't stand you. I'm giving you the specifics you so desperately want. You lecture us on kindness and how to be nice and be kind while you bully the little people around you. Half your staff walks out every other week because they can't stand working for you. What does it take to make somebody walk out of working for a royal? Probably a lot, right? Is it, like, is it over? Is Harry finally done with his incessant whining and the demonization of his family? I don't think so. I don't think it's done by a, by a long shot. He's, he's out there giving these interviews. I'm really hoping this is it so we don't have to keep talking about this guy. Um, they don't seem to ever get bored of the spotlight, no matter what they say to us publicly. Here to discuss it all and what we learned from these interviews are social commentators Sophie Corcoran and Leilani Dowding, and they are fired up. Welcome <laughs> back to the show, Sophie and Leilani. Great to see you. Thanks for having us on. What did I miss? Those are the, he, he wants the specifics. As soon as they lay out for us what we did wrong, then uh, we, will, we will be willing to apologize. How dumb is he? I mean, this is, he, th he's stupid. How, how he hard really do you have to look? Stupid. You nailed it. You absolutely nailed every single point right there. I mean, how can he not know what he's done? He comes on and he just moans and complains nonstop about his family, airs all their dirty laundry um, in public. Um, he's already told us, like you said, that William said everything that was wrong that he found with his wife, that she was, you know, abrasive and what have you and difficult. And he still doesn't, he still doesn't get it. He still thinks it's about race and he still thinks it's about the press and, you know, they're all making it up. But you, you nailed every single point and he needs to go and apologize. And instead of saying, oh, you know, the olive branch is always open uh, and, and held out for them. He needs to apologize. He needs to make the move. He's done so much wrong 
and she, along with her, and he needs to go and apologize. Not wait for yeah, I don't need- um, them to tell him what's what he's done wrong. Yeah, what he's wrong. I I feel like it's not even a question of apologizing at this point. He could for all the book tour and all the smears he's thrown on them. It's just you're an unlikable person. That's really what we've mm-hmm. seen over the past couple of years. The British royal family did a great job hiding that truth from the rest of us. What a whiny, needy small person you are, not to mention your wife, and now the truth is out. So it's not really a question of say you're sorry. It's too late. They saw who you are. They saw who your wife was, and we've seen it too. So I don't, you tell me, Sophie, whether, what's his next move? Because if he doesn't get it by this point, he's not going to get it. I mean, there's, I don't think there's any need for reconciliation anymore. I mean, the palace have been brilliant. Let's not forget the palace have behaved exemplary over this. I mean, Charles threw an olive branch to both Meghan and Harry when he said, you know, they were there building their life overseas. He's consistently said uh, King Charles is a very, very caring, very, very generous man. He has continually said that he wants reconciliation. The Queen, when she was alive, said that she wanted to see reconciliation before she died. Obviously, unfortunately, that did not happen. But it is Harry that is the one that is carrying on. You cannot expect reconciliation when you keep going to the press and trashing your family. But this man has never, he has never once been able to take a single ounce of responsibility for himself. This man is nearly 40 years old, Megan. He's acting mm-hmm. like a child. He needs to grow a pair and grow up and stop acting like a kid. He's a middle-aged man. What is wrong with him? It is just- exactly right. There is something wrong with him. Like, there, honestly, there is. Like, the book excerpts, um, Angela Levin has been tweeting out excerpts from the book. They're shocking. <laughs> I haven't read the book yet. I've only seen his nonstop press tour. And um, one of them talks about how when Megan gave birth, he sucked up all the laughing gas. She had none available to her. And he was like, fall down sort of off because of all the laughing gas he took on the birth of his child, not, not his wife. Secondly, he admits to peeing in his pants like an hour before his first date with Megan. What what grown adult pees in his pants? I'm sorry, but like there is something wrong with him, Leilani. Megan, it's so unbecoming of a prince to behave like this. He is selling out like a cast member from Jersey Shore. You know, it's (laughs) so embarrassing what he's doing or saying. And I'm sure Megan's you know, encouraging him to, you know, give off this verbal diarrhea of everything. I'm sure when they end up breaking up eventually, um, she'll use that in court against him, saying, look, look, you know, when he, when, uh, when I was giving birth, uh, he had all my, uh, my gas, so I couldn't have any. And I'm sure she's going to use it against him. It's just so embarrassing. And it's not the way a prince should behave. And, and why is he doing this? There's so many excerpts in that book that are, highly embarrassing and you kind of cringe but at the same time I wish they'd been spoken about more in the document um in the interviews yesterday because those interviews were so boring and so miserable and they dragged on with just complaint after complaint after complaint and actually the ITV one was an hour and a half and I got an hour through I was like oh my goodness I cannot possibly sit through another half an hour of these complaints <laughs> about his privileged little life and how it's not, you know, he, he's just so resentful and he's just got so much anger and he's holding on um, to just so much resentment. And mm-hmm. it's he has to let go at some point and stop and just try and live in some kind of peace. He says he's happy and he's in peace, but he's it must be opposite day because, you know, you can tell the bloke isn't Honestly. at all whatsoever. What kind of a prince talks about his penis publicly? I mean, this happened. But like he's <laughs> calls it a todger. I guess that's a British thing. I guess todger is it's how he got just, frostbite on like, it. How how he's been circumcised. And talking and, about and, oh god, and he's revealing not like, just like, not just the condition of his penis, but of of the future king of England. He's talking about Prince William's penis. Who gave him permission for that? I'm sorry, it's not dignified. Not at all. It's. Sophie, you say, I can't even speak about it. It's like- The queen is rolling over in her grave. Go ahead, Sophie. The whole book has been just a massive PR disaster. I mean, I do not know who is advising this man or surely he must have read the book before and thought, hang on a minute, I can't put literally half of this in. It is so grotesquely embarrassing in every single manner, him getting pushed into the dog bowl by his brother and whining like a little rat, despite the fact that he'd served two tours in Afghanistan. Obviously, then he made the crass comments about the Taliban, which is putting the British public in danger, and then telling us all about his frostbitten penis. I mean, you said a while ago about, you know, 
if this isn't a way a prince should be behaving. This isn't a way a grown adult should be behaving in any manner mm. at all. I mean, I'm half the man's age, and to me, he acts like a complete, utter child, and he needs to grow up. This isn't a way that any person should be behaving in the public, let alone somebody who has been as sheltered, who has been as privileged, who has had one of the best educations money can buy, as Prince Harry has done. And he's never had to have a shred of accountability. A lot of that is because of his insanely privileged life that he leads. And he's always, you know, full of blame for everybody else. I mean, the way he talks about the British people is absolutely disgusting. I mean, his comments about the Brexit voters in the UK how we're all racist. I would like to inform you, man, that those Brexit voters that are all racist have used their hard-earned tax money that they have gone out to work for day in, day out, something that that man has never really had to do and grafted so that that tax money could then be used to pay for his privileged life, for his privileged education, that he then goes abroad and makes millions of pounds saying that he's somehow been oppressed. I mean, it's such a massive insult to the British people and the British public. And he's just a global embarrassment. He doesn't behave like an adult. He behaves like a complete infant who is grotesquely privileged, who is obsessed with the sound of his own voice, a little bit like his wife. Oh, my God. I'm clapping, clapping. Yes, that point you just made about how it's like, how dare he call all the people who voted in favor of Brexit Racist, which his Netflix uh, documentary 100% does. They spend mm-hmm. a lot of time on it. It's not a passing reference. It's a main point of the piece. How dare he turn around and say that about the people who were funding his lifestyle as he was bitching about the size of his castle? I mean, that's why people can't stand them. It's nothing to do with William or Camilla. And now, He's so dumb, he thinks he can wiggle out of some of his accusations, like the one to Oprah about the royal family, by just denying it ever happened. Here is one of the most outrageous claims, I mentioned it twice, where he's now trying to claim that he didn't, that he didn't call the royal family racist, Meghan didn't call them, they, that's, that wasn't the implication at all of their Oprah interview. This is with the ITV sit down with Bradbury, listen. In the Oprah interview, you accuse members of your family of racism. You don't even... Well, of... The British press said that. Right. Did did Meghan ever mention they were racist? She said there were troubling comments about... Uh, She was concerned about his skin colour. Right. Wouldn't you describe that as essentially racist? I wasn't not having lived within that family. Right. So again, going going back to the difference between what my understanding is because of my own experience, the difference between racism and unconscious bias, the two things are different. But once it's been acknowledged or pointed out to you as an individual or as an institution that you have unconscious bias, you therefore have an opportunity to learn and grow from that in order so that you are part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Otherwise, unconscious bias then moves into the category of racism. Oh my God, there's so much to go over. <laughs> All right, his little his little white privilege lecture. I mean, please spare me. Please spare me your woke your woke lecture, right? But there it is. Okay, so here's the natural follow-up. So do you have any reason to believe that the royal family did anything about their alleged unconscious bias after your Oprah interview? No, so you are saying they're racist. According to you, unconscious bias moves into racism if nothing is done to arrest it. And you're telling me sitting here right now they've done nothing to arrest it. So you are calling them racist, correct? Would have been a great follow-up. Secondly, let's go back to Megan's claim. Let's listen to it for ourselves and see how it played out to see why the, the evil British press got so confused when all she was really alleging was unconscious bias that hadn't yet manifested into racism. How they didn't glean that distinction. I know not, but here's the original sin by Megan. In those months when I was pregnant, all around this same time, so we have in tandem the conversation of he won't be given security, he's not going to be given a title, and also concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. What? And who who is having that conversation with you? What? So, um There is a conversation. Hold up. Hold up. There's Stop several right conver- now. There are several conversations. There's a about conversation it. with you. With Harry. 
about how dark your baby is going to be? Potentially, and what that would mean or look like. Ooh. And you're not going to tell me who had the conversation? I think that would be very damaging to them. Oh, be very damaging, but not damaging as much as it would be if it had graduated to full-on racism, just damaging in the unconscious bias space. Just for good measure, here's Harry weighing in on it in the same interview. That conversation <laughs> I'm never going to share. Um, but at the time, at the time it was awkward. I was a bit shocked. Um, can, you, can you tell us what the question was? No, I don't, I'm not comfortable sharing that. No, because he knew it would reflect very negatively on somebody because he knew he was accusing them of racism. These two, they, they it's a lot. I mean, what the, he said to Tom Bradby is a lie. He did accuse them of racism. That's why mm -hmm. Prince William had to come out and say it, Leilani, say, we're not a racist family. Why is he doing this now? Why is there this now revisionist history? You know what? This is crazy to me. I don't understand it because he really did backtrack on what was said. And it was very obvious. I mean, you saw Oprah like, what? I mean, it's so dramatic, Megan. And uh, asking about the child and what the child might look like. First of all, it's what a lot of mixed race couples do. My mum is from the Philippines. My mum wondered what colour my skin was. In the interview with Tom Bradbury, um, Harry was actually trying to say it was unconscious bias and it's something that white people do more. No, my mom's from the Philippines. She did that. And then she did that again when my sister had a baby. You know, she wanted to know what her eyes going to look like. You know, what's her skin color going to be? It's very, very normal. And, you know, Oprah was making this whole drama out of it. Megan played into it. They totally. implied that there was a lot of racism going on. And I think... Harry's actually had a lot of pushback because people like me, people who are mixed race, will say, come on, don't be so ridiculous. This is a normal question. What is your child going to look like? How, you know, will her skin be like my mom's or like my dad's? I mean, he, they could have been asking if it would be pale like Harry's, you know, it's not, it's, no one's making any kind of racist connotation by, by talk, discussing a child like that. And, I think this is why he's had to backtrack, but it was very obvious that they were trying to push this racist angle because, you know, it's America and they Americans love to bite on fake racism going on. That's like, true. Sound bites like that from um, Meghan and Harry, like they want to just grab onto it and run and write the whole royal family's racist. It, it, it's, it's catnip. It's just what happens. They'll, they'll hold and it worked exactly. Those. Exactly. It worked exactly they wanted the way they mm -hmm. wanted it to. It dominated the headlines the next day. Now they claim they were shocked, shocked to see how it dominated. That's exactly what they wanted, Sophie. And as I pointed out when I was opening, literally within the past month, they accepted an award from the Kennedy family here that, and I'm quoting, for their heroic stance against the structural racism of the royal family. So who are they kidding? I don't understand. So they're being treated in the US as some sort of modern day version of Jesus, unbecoming all of this racism in the royal family because they're having a row with their family in public. But if I don't mind myself reminding, there was one person, one member of the royal family who has proven to actually be a racist. And that is the prince that referred to somebody as, I quote, a khaki and also wore a swastika. And if you could kindly remind me what prince that was. Oh, wait, it was Prince Harry. So for him to be banned in about these allegations about his family members, and they knew what they were doing by saying, I don't feel comfortable in saying who said that, because what it would do is it would enable mm -hmm. speculation of the press to which people would accuse various different members of the royal family who said it, and they would not be able to escape from that accusation because the Prince Harry wasn't going to say that they knew what they were doing with that accusation. But there is one member of the royal family who has actually been proven to be a racist, and that is himself. So for him to then put those allegations on the rest of his members of royal family without saying who it is, without being clear, and then to backtrack on it is a disgraceful treatment of his family members. And I don't understand why the world is lauding this pair as some sort of, you know, social justice racist warriors, giving them all these stupid awards when they have done nothing but argue with their family in public, there are people, genuine people, who deserve these awards much more than they do. Much mm -hmm. more. Leilani, you're so right. Meghan Markle sat there in that Oprah interview looking doe-eyed. Oh, I'm so, mm -hmm. so sad. Yes, they brought up my baby's skin color. Yes. She didn't say, Oprah, let me make clear. 
We are not saying that any member of the royal family is racist. We're Mm -hmm. saying there's unconscious bias that some people innocently have, and sometimes it gets uncomfortable when you call them out on it. She's a grown-up. She's not four. She could have said that if that's what she wanted to say. She wanted us to walk away with the exact impression we did, which is there's a rabid racist running around the royal family who's worried the next baby's skin color is going to be unacceptably dark. That's what she wanted us to believe. That's why the British press printed that. And here's here's another tell, yet another way we know. Because while out of one side of his mouth, he's like, no, we never said that. We did not say the royal family's racist. He, at the other side of his mouth, doubles down on the original claim to Oprah. Not about the baby, but about the British family, the royal family being racists. He talks about how they didn't like Meghan because he says she was, quote, black, or then he corrects, biracial. Listen to this. I think it's soundbite 10. Soon after their relationship became public, Harry insisted on putting out a statement condemning some of the tabloid coverage of Meghan and what he called, quote, the racial undertones of comment pieces. You write that your dad and your brother, William, were furious with you Mm -hmm. for doing that. Why? They felt as though it made them look bad. They felt as though they didn't have a chance or weren't able to do that for their partners. What Meghan had to go through was similar in some part to what Kate and what Camilla went through. Very different circumstances. But then you add in the race element, which was what the press, British press jumped on straight away. I went into this incredibly naive. I had no idea the British press was so bigoted. Hell, I was probably bigoted y- you- before the relationship with, with Megan. You think you were bigoted before the relationship with Megan? I, I don't know. Put it this way. I didn't see what I now see. Okay, that, that's not the right sound bite, but I'm going to play the right one. But that one's delicious too, right? It's like the British press is bigoted. Um, and, and maybe he used to be bigoted. That was, of course, before he did the work, did the work on unconscious bias, I'm sure. Here's the sound bite where he attacks the royal family as being against her from the beginning because of her skin color, 11. In his book, Harry writes that when he introduced Meghan Markle to his family in 2016, his father initially took a liking to her. But William was skeptical, disdainfully referring to Meghan as an American actress. Though Harry doesn't specify who, he says other members of the royal family were uneasy as well. Right from the beginning, before they even had a chance to get to know her. And the UK press jumped on that, and here we are. And what was that based on, that mistrust? The fact that she was American, an actress, divorced, black, biracial, with a black mother. Those were just four of the typical stereotypes that is a, becomes a feeding frenzy for the British press. But all those things in the, within the family also were, were sources of mistrust. Yes, you know, my family read the tabloids. You know, it's, it's laid out uh, at breakfast when everyone comes together. So whether you walk around saying you believe it or not, it's still, it's still leaving an imprint in your mind. So if you have that judgment based on a stereotype right at the beginning, it's very, very hard to get over that. And a large part of it for the family, but also the British press and numerous other people is like, he's changed. She must be a witch. There it is, right there. Got it? He, it, he says it, that, the, that his family, he says the family, was upset that she was biracial. So, <laughs> I mean... So, here's look, the thing, Megan. I, it's absolute rubbish. Actually, uh, Everybody loved, he, well, he said that his father initially really liked her. And the first thing he would have seen before anything else was her skin. So he didn't mind that she was mixed race. Second of all, she's not black. You know, she is mixed. Um, When she was acting in America, she would put herself down as Caucasian. She's also what, when I was modeling in Los Angeles, I was under the... um, ethnically ambiguous, which I think is what Megan would have come under, right? So what Megan has done is she saw the press because the people in Britain loved that she looked a little bit different, loved that, you know, you couldn't really place her. Was she Spanish? Was she Italian? She was beautiful. Um, and she then decided to play up to that. And, you know, suddenly she she wanted to tell everyone that she was mixed race and people embraced it. You just had to look at the wedding, at the way people embraced, you know, the different ethnicity. So for her, him to come out then and say it's because she was black, I mean, mixed race, that's absolute rubbish because Charles liked her initially. 
Um, he, he could tell, of course, what she was. And, and I think what he also mentioned is that she was American, she was an actress, and she was divorced. And I think the bigger problems were that she was an actress and that she was divorced. Um, after seeing some of, you know, her sex scenes and whatever in Suits, it's not really... Um, yeah, it has nothing to do with race. Yeah. He added that. In his book says, William said to him, she's an American, she's an actress, let's just wait and see. You know, like mm -hmm. kind of tempering his enthusiasm over her, which, Sophie, would make sense. That's like, first of all, I, I think there's a general presumption probably amongst most in the British royal family that ideally you'd marry a Brit, right, in a perfect world. And also the implication is maybe she's not going to want to be part of this whole institution. She's an American. They behave differently. Differently. They fought a war to get away from royalty. Maybe they don't want in. And secondly, um, yeah, she's an actress. They have she has her own life, is basically what he's trying to say. Mm -hmm. So, like, don't get your hopes up. And only now he adds the biracial. The fact that she was biracial was a problem for my family. Yeah, I mean, William's character judgment has been spot on throughout pretty much all of this. I mean, I, I recall when he called <laughs> her arrogant, disrespectful, or rude, or something along those lines. I mean. It's not wrong, is he? I mean, let's be honest, he's, he weren't wrong. So I think his character judgment has been pretty spot on of uh, Meghan Markle, and I think he's definitely been vindicated in the way she has acted both towards the family and the press. But like, and like um, Leilani said, I mean, I was young, really young when they, they were getting married in secondary school, and everybody was so, so excited about the prospect of having a princess that doesn't look like the rest of the princesses we've already had. It was never used as a negative thing. And everything that's come about her in the press, none of it at all has been about her race. The majority of it has been about her character, which is perfectly, mm -hmm. she's a horrible person. So to talk about race, I think he's just absolutely ridiculous. I mean, none of this at all was about race, as you know, Prince Harry likes to say the royal family weren't racist. So I just think, you know, to blame it on this behaviour is so wrong. A lot of the anger has been about the way she acted towards the royal family. The British people loved Meghan. We love, love, love Meghan. You can see that by the fact that they, as the royal wedding, they weren't going to be a king and a queen. And they still got an enormous reception from the British public because mm -hmm. people were so excited about the prospect of having a princess that was mixed race. It was something that was hugely exciting for the royal family. So for them to then say that that was why they didn't like her is a load of rubbish. We know the reason. It's why a lie. It's it's yet another lie. I mean, mm -hmm. he got caught. He, Meghan Markle got caught in a lie in her Oprah interview. She said, I mean, she, there were many lies in that interview, but one of them was that, you know, she was distressed by the tabloids because they said she made Kate cry over her wedding when the opposite was true. Kate made me cry, but she made good. She brought flowers and she apologized. So I'm the victim. Let me just make clear. I am the victim. I'm always the victim. That's what mm -hmm. she wants us to know. But, you know, Kate and Kate was the villain. Well, now in his book, he reveals that actually Megan upset Kate by complaining to Kate about Kate's, Kate said, this bridesmaid's dress doesn't fit on my daughter that you wanted to wear this flower girl dress on Charlotte. And it needs to be whatever taken in. And Megan basically said something to Kate to the effect of, according to Harry, oh, you have baby brain thanks to your hormones. And Kate was upset and basically said, according to Harry, you don't know me well enough to talk to me like that, right? You don't mention my hormones to me. Well, you know what? I didn't learn about that from the Oprah interview. Why wasn't that disclosed when she was airing her dirty laundry about how she was the only victim, Kate was the only mean one, Kate was the villain? Why didn't she disclose that? Because it didn't fit her little narrative she was trying to paint about how poor me Megan has been bullied incessantly by the mean royals, especially that mean Kate. Yeah, I mean, I mean this is the thing, isn't it? She, um, she, she carries on and carries on about being a victim. And I think that's the problem, that everyone's just sick and tired of hearing about her being the victim in all of this. She has a husband that loves her. She has two healthy children. She has a lifestyle that people could probably only ever dream of. And I think people are just so sick and tired of the victimhood that's going on and, and the poor me. And it's rubbed off on Harry. Harry was like the nation. I think Harry was the nation's favorite prince, really. He was the sweetheart of, of the UK. Everybody loved him. Everyone just wanted him to be happy. Everyone was, was delighted when he found somebody that he was in love with. And then what happened? Just, yeah. All the toys got thrown out the pram and there were complaints after complaints after complaints. And they just 
turned against the British people. They turned against their own family. They decided to do a runner. They decided they were going to leave America. I'm um, sorry, leave the UK to go to Canada. Then they couldn't get the security they wanted. They got offered this security by this guy that I don't think they even knew who was going to give him their big mansion house because, you know, the cottage at Kensington Tyler Palace Perry. was far too small. And mm -hmm. people are just sick of it. They're completely and utterly sick of it. Yeah, they've never stopped complaining since. All right, stand by. Two-minute break. We'll be right back more with Sophie and Leilani, including on um, <laughs> why he's upset that he wasn't invited on the royal plane, on the royal plane, after the Oprah interview, after the lies, after the racist stuff, he doesn't understand why he didn't get to go on the plane with the rest of the royals. Stand by for that. So one of the many things he feels slighted over, and it is a long list, is the fact that the day the queen died, which was September 8th, 2022, this is a couple months ago, he happened to be in Great Britain. And he's mad that when he texted William, this is after the Oprah interview, after all this stuff. He's in the middle of the Netflix deal. It's about to hit air a couple months. And his book, he texted uh, his brother William to say, how are you getting to Balmoral, where the queen was in Scotland, where, where she was dying? And he didn't get a response. And here's how he described his, how he'd been dissed, sound by 13. I asked my brother, I said, what are your plans? How are you and Kate getting up there? Um, and then... A couple of hours later, you know, all of the fam family members that live within the Windsor and Ascot area were jumping on a plane together, a plane with 12, 14, maybe 16 seats. You were not invited on that plane. I was not invited. <laughs> Sophie, whatever could explain him not being invited? Yeah, I mean, don't forget, this was such a historic moment of national mourning. You know, uh, yes, it was a death in their family, but it was also one that was a death that the nation would have to mourn and, and such a historic moment in pretty much all of our lives that have only seen one one. Uh, very few people that have seen another so far. So they obviously didn't want Harry and Meghan overshadowing it. This was the moment. This was about the Queen. This was about the country. It was not about Meghan and Harry. And I feel like they're quite angry that they were not able to make it as such. And I think the royal family were very much aware that those two, should they have, you know, been present for a lot of it, a lot of the questions were going to be about, oh, is Meghan at Balmoral? Is Harry not at Balmoral? A lot of the headlines would, for some reason, because... You know, they create all this drama, obsess over that, and it shouldn't have been about that. It should have solely been about the Queen and the royal family. I think that's why they're really mad. But of course they weren't going to be fighting because they just want to steal headlines. They just want to make attention. And they've offended the entire royal family up until this point and have continued to make the life hell for their grandmother right up until the moment that she passed away. So, of course, they didn't want them on the plane with her. And I actually think a lot of it uh, was about having Meghan come up mm -hmm. to Balmain. As we remember Kate also stayed home with the kids and did not attend Balmoral. And the, the, the conflict was about them not taking Meghan to Balmoral. And they, they made it clear, do not bring Meghan to Balmoral. It will overshadow everything. This is about the nation. This is about the queen. This is about the country. This is not about Meghan. And he, they obviously weren't happy about that. Can you imagine, like, they only think about everything through their own lens. He doesn't give one thought for what King Charles was going through. This mm -hmm. is his mother, right? And he's about to become king now. Or Prince William. This makes him one step closer. And it's his grandmother with whom he's been very close. And he, unlike Harry, has been servicing the royal family and serving, you know, in her behest for all this time. How might they feel with this traitor sitting on board the plane? Maybe they felt a little uncomfortable being around him after all he done. There's not a thought for anyone else but him. Go ahead. There, well, there never is. And he, like I said, he's changed history here because um, the whole argument was, I think, that they, he wanted to bring Megan. And that's what caused the time delay. And I think that Chait had stayed at home. Um, I don't believe Camilla w w went either. Um, and she certainly wasn't there at the moment of the death. So, um, you know, as always, Prince Harry keeps thinking about himself. And the whole both of the interviews started about his mum and it was the same thing. He didn't think for a moment about how his brother might feel or about how shocked his father might be in having to give this news. You know, this is about Diana, I mean, not, you know, not Charles's mum, but um, 
you know, he he had he didn't think about any of it, and that's how the two interviews started. So it's carried on through to the Queen, where again he's not thought about anyone else's thought uh, feelings except for his own. So yes, Kate stayed and looked after the children. Harry wanted Meghan to come, and of course, both Prince Charles, who was prince at the time, and Prince William would have been thinking, you know, what are they going to use this for? Is this going to end up in their Netflix documentary or is this going to be part of the book? Like, yes, you know, they. I can understand fully why they didn't want them traveling on the same uh, plane. So it could all be public information about what they're speaking about in their, you know, in the last moments of the Queen's life. Me too. And their instincts were dead on because now we know from his book, he mm-hmm. was writing, he is in here writing about all these personal private moments, like the fight he had with Prince William, who came to his cottage and wound up grabbing him by the collar, breaking his necklace, and he fell over. Now he wants us to feel sorry for him because he fell down and he broke the dog bowl and he refused to fight back. I mean, honestly, this is like, if this is like a fight that warrants mention in a book, when I was growing up with my siblings, my brother, he my, tortured me. My sisters, <laughs> you know, they were older than I was. My God, we threw down way better than this. In fact, my team, my brilliant team came up with a representation of what their fight seemed to look like, not throwing down, nothing like Rocky and Apollo, looked more like Frazier and Niles Crane. I bring you Soundbite 26. It's not a tantrum and I'm not jealous. I'm just fed up! (laughs) I'm fed up with being second all the time. You know, I wanted to be a psychiatrist like Mom way before you did, but because you were older, you got there first. You were first to get married. You were first to give Dad the grandchild he always wanted. By the time I get around to doing anything, it's all chewed meat. You think I'm crying about something that we can't change. Oh, you wouldn't change it if you could. You'll love it. Oh, let it go, Niles. I can't let it go. My nose is rubbed in it every day. (laughs) Here's your fat face. Give me that. Give me that. Give me that. Give me that. Flashback! You're climbing in my crib and jumping on me! You stole my mommy! (laughs) (laughs) Who takes a disagreement like that, private between brothers, elevates it to, you know, in the book to try to make the one side look bad, where once again he knows. Prince Williams, he can't defend himself. He has to do what the royal family wants, which so far has been to stiff arm this couple and just ignore them. Yeah, that's my major concern about all of the TV interviews, the documentary, the book, everything is the reason why Harry has said that he's doing what he's doing is so that he can speak his truth. And let's say his truth, because it's his truth and not the truth, as we know. And to basically break free from all the lies that his family have somehow fed the press. But the only person that I can recall who is actually feeding the press lies is Harry. And he yeah. knows full well that William and the royal family can't respond. He knows that. That's why he's taking advantage of it. That's why he's spreading so many lies. So the stuff that he's accusing the royal family of, he is doing exactly mm-hmm. that. I mean, the dog bowl scenario, again, I have some serious questions about that because apparently the first thing he ever did was call his therapist. I mean, he didn't bother, you know, to call his wife or to call somebody else. He called his therapist that he has on on speed dial. I mean, this poor therapist has got a lot of work to do, shall I say. But uh, (laughs) in the Oprah interview that he said that when Megan needed help with her mental health, you know, he couldn't get it. So Again, we've got real discrepancies between certain interviews to others. I mean, we had it in between the 60 Minutes and the GMA one. He said in the 60 Minutes one, he basically portrayed Camilla to be this absolute witch. And then the GMA one, he said he wasn't. So he's not even consistent with his own story. You're Mm -hmm. 100% right. So last question, Leilani, what does the royal family do? Does this up the stakes enough that they respond or no? Do you know what? I think when you deal with narcissistic people, you cannot respond because if they go tit for tat and they start, you know, saying something back, it just gives Meghan and Harry more ammunition for their next complaint moan fest, you know? And I don't want to hear another hour or two of Harry and Meghan complaining about something else or a whole new series two on Netflix, complain, complain, complain. So I think you know, the royal family are doing what the royal family always do, and they're being dignified in their silence. Mm-hmm. The answer is not to deny the claims about your todger. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's so Jersey Shore. <laughs> it's very Jersey Shore. Leilani, what a pleasure. Thank you both so much for coming on. <laughs> 